You have questions, we have answers. This is Jane Muller. And this is Ken Muller. Welcome to our show, all about real estate with Ken and Jane. Today, Jane, we are going to discuss the role of the planning board plays in a township. And to help us break it down, we have with us as our guest, Steve Phillips. He's a member of the East Brunswick Planning Board. Steve, welcome to our show. Uh, Welcome and thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. So to get started, just give us your brief bio and how long you've been involved in the uh, East Brunswick uh, Planning Board. Um, There is a statute. I'm a member of the zoning board, so let's understand how I come to that. And there is a statute that somebody from the zoning board needs to be on the planning board as part of a statutory requirement. And there was an opportunity or an opening of somebody who had had that position um, about 2017, and they had to leave. They were moving out of town. So uh, the, the call came up with somebody on the zoning board be interested in being on the planning board. And I, and I uh, volunteered. I didn't know what I was doing that day, so I said my hand, stuck my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, yes, so, so I am now on the, on the planning board, but my background before that was the zoning board. Right. So if my math serves me correctly, you've been on the planning board then a total of seven years, give or take. Depending, yes, that would be fair. Yes, fair, yeah. that's a long yeah. time. That's yeah. a long time. So I guess so. You picked up quite a bit of uh, additional knowledge in that time, and you know, and being on both boards, I guess it's very um, useful because you get to see the differences and you know the subtleties of what each the responsibility and role each each board has and how they differ within the township. Well, yeah, but the other important thing is is that if the if the planning board is doing something when when anything they might do results in a zoning request, mm-hmm. I now have the background of why they were asking mm-hmm. in the first place for this variance because I was on the planning board when that project first came before us. In the in, in the opposite of that, there are times that something becomes before the zoning board that goes back to the planning board because it takes on a new role inside of the application process. And I was there for the initial testimony that took place on the zoning board. So we've had instances in both cases where it's cross-reference of of data and material. Right. And then to even make it more interesting, there's there's the redevelopment committee in uh, East Brunswick. So that that plays an additional role because what they propose goes to the planning board, as I understand it, for approval and then to the council. So there's a lot of different boards with different roles in the town. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's absolutely so. Yeah. So let's start. So this is a general listener audience. So please explain like what the role in, in general terms is of the planning board and, and you know how it's what it, what its purpose is for the, the community. The planning board is structured so that there are approximately eight or nine individuals who are volunteers from the town on the planning board, in addition to the um, the mayor. And yeah. one council member, and the uh, general general manager of the of the town. Okay. So they're, they've got three spots, and then the rest are all volunteers. Okay. Mm-hmm. And is do, do you know if that's the same structure in in all the municipalities in New Jersey, or or could vary based on each town having its own specific ordinance on how the planning board is? Composed? Well, there's some standards there. Yeah. But the, but the variances would be there are towns that are too small to have both the zoning and planning board. So they're combined. Ah, uh, okay. Uh-huh. Okay. But as far as the towns that have both a planning and a zoning board, I, I don't imagine there's too much variation in structure from one town to another. But I'm only most familiar with the East Brunswick yes. um, zoning and planning boards. Yeah. I have a question. So as you mentioned, um, there's a three spot, which is the council, the mayor, and the, the manager, right? The uh, uh, Well, one council member, correct? Yeah. And the council member changes yeah. over time. Right? Yeah. How about the voting? Can they vote, the mayor and the council vote, or they just observer for no, the board? No, everybody who's there can vote. Mm-hmm. There are times, for example, where there may be a requirement for a, um, a recru- recu- recusal mm-hmm. okay. and where either a for some reason they have some other reasons why they can't vote. They have mm-hmm. um, interests in, in something yeah. mm-hmm. or um, somebody in their family or some other mm-hmm. reason why legitimately they can't vote. So they would abstain in any voting. Mm-hmm. But that would go for the members of the board, board. regardless whether yeah. or not it's the mayor 
a, mm -hmm. a council person or the business, uh, or the business manager. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, I, see. I must misunderstood because I thought uh, the mayor normally don't vote. It's only let like the board member vote. Maybe I just I just misunderstood. No, the, it, yes, but sometimes that's why the mayor has to be particularly careful mm -hmm. because as a public figure, yeah. he mm -hmm. does not want to um, present a situation where it appears he's biased mm -hmm. about a particular application before he would vote on it. Okay. Right. Okay. That would, you know, you don't want to um, present yourself with an, with a potential for exposure that way. Okay. okay. Right. Right. Um, so, talking about, let's see, like, let's talk about some specific issues that the planning board addresses, like in in a town like East Brunswick. Um, I guess if there's a new development that's going to be proposed, where where a developer wants to uh, acquire some land and you know subdivide it, that would be something that the planning board would uh, would uh, come before the planning board. Well, that's uh that's another interesting question. Most of the time, yes. But what happens is is that the town doesn't ask people to come in with the development program. Normally, mm -hmm. if somebody wants to look to buy a stretch of property, acreage, mm -hmm. and they want to put up a development, they would go into the building and building department and apply with an application mm -hmm. to do that. Okay. Once it gets inside the application and the application is deemed complete, in other words, all the questions that the town has regarding what the applicant wants to do is now submitted, then the application can be reviewed. They may decide that it needs to go to the planning board or it needs to go to the zoning board, depending on exactly what it is they're trying to do. Can you give an example, uh, like what kind of uh, application would need to go to the planning board. Or in the past, in general terms, yeah. what applications you've dealt with. Like this year, I looked a little bit on the website at the, at the meeting minutes summaries. And But if you could give an example about something in yes. the recent, recent on, this on year. On Hearts Lane, yeah. there, were, uh, there have been requests to put warehouses. Right. The warehouses that are, that I'm talking past tense now because it's they're been, being been approved and they're, and they're in construction or actually finished. Um, was where the old junkyards used to be. Right. And I'll give my age by saying I remember when Hearts Lane was a dirt road. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know Hearts Lane very well. Yeah, yeah. And, that's the and so there's, um, you know, I used yeah. to laugh in, in the meeting and say, wait, does that mean you're going to take away the 53 Buick I used yeah. to get parts from? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Be on the property. Or maybe and somebody was, drove in your family, right? <laughs> it, it, it's a joke, but the fact is, is that yeah. those are all the junkyards. It used yeah. to be Giancola junk, I think. Was right. the, yeah. Well, and various it, people. Various. Well, let's leave it. Leave it that, yeah, without names. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's interesting because then it gets into the whole situation of some of the other questions that have come up. Well, they have to have clean dirt. Mm -hmm. they got, sure. they got to remediate. They've, yeah. got to, they've got to repair damage that was done before. That's when they put the application in, Ken, and then okay. it'll go through uh, soil, freehold soil conservation. Basically, it'll right. go through stream encroachments. It'll go through environmental issues. And right. each of those particular agencies has to sign off on it uh -huh. as part of the application process. Yeah. Right. And then what is planning? That's what I was trying to get at. So what is planning board's role in, in something like that? You, you mentioned that like the, the environmental, the uh, freehold for the soil. So what does planning board have to approve we, we or vote it. on? You just review it. You basically re review it in the totality yes. of the circumstances and make sure that all, yes. the, all the boxes are checked and then look and at the, the and uh, authorities the, beyond our, our scope oh. have mm -hmm reviewed this and are either okay with it or have offered their suggestions and changes. That's when the planning board would take a more accurate role, af active role mm -hmm. and say, okay, it looks to me like environment wants such and such. Are you prepared to do that? Uh -huh. And you ask the applicant, you know, when he's before the board, are you, uh, is that okay with you? Will you comply with that? And so forth so that we get a complete picture of exactly what it is that they're, that they're agreeing to. I see. Okay, mm -hmm. that that so it's a lot of so it's a lot of different a lot of different uh, entities involved in something, and you guys are like the overseer and the final say or final uh, approval. Final Correct. approval. Okay. Now uh, we don't do that on our own. I know you have another question, but we don't yeah. do that on our own. We have a, a planning, and we have an engineering firm that are public companies that we hire on to take care of some of that specific work because you can't do that all in-house. 
Yes. Right. 100%. Like what about like the engineering and the stormwater control, the runoff, the, you know, if you're putting up a building, you're displacing, you know, soil. So you're going to have additional runoff concerns. You may need a stormwater retention basin. Basins, or, exactly. you know, and that's where the um, professional help that, that the board has will come in. They, they would work with the applicant before we ever see the plans. Okay. And they'll say you need yeah. to have X amount of stormwater management here. And based on, uh, you know, five year flood, 100 year flood, whatever the criteria are, yeah. in order for that to be um, built into the plan before the planning board ever sees it. Now, yeah. things may come up during the planning board meeting mm-hmm. that make people scratch their heads and say, hmm, we need to go back to the drawing board on this. Right. And that's something that a board member can can question or request from the engineering firm and say, you know, I don't think that's enough or but or you have to or you're or you're bound by whatever as long as they comply with the ordinance and they say we've got we have enough we have a stormwater basin that's sized appropriately based on it. You can't can you can you ask for more because you because you feel there's a need or or you're bound by the statute uh, no, we've we've had uh, a situation before us. We've had a situation before us where um, there was a lot of concerns and complaints from neighbors mm-hmm. okay. about potential runoff. And so what we did was we said, okay, so what's the problem of just making the detention basin deeper? Mm-hmm. Ah. And That's- if we can put three more feet in this detention basin, that would then change it from being a 100-year potential flood to a 400-year potential flood. Right. That makes sense. And that mitigates the chances that we'll have runoff from this property. Right. And the boards did do something like that. So that's where public input combined with concerns from neighbors can, can make a change in an application. Okay. And that was something that was voted on and a by the board, right? So the board could have, it could have been a disagreement among board members, but it's a majority vote, I guess, determines the, um, or it's what? more than a majority. You, you need more than a majority. Yeah, so, for example, depending on what variance or what needs you have, you, could, you, you you're not going to win four to three. Oh. Oh, interesting. Okay. So you need, so out of these seven members, what you need, it, you might five, need five. five. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Interesting. Not a majority. Wow, I learned something I mean, new. Yeah, I learned a lot today. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Why don't we take a short break? We'll be right back after these messages. Okay. Welcome back to our show. We're joined today by um, Steve Phillips. He's a member of the East Brunswick Planning Board. So Steve, just before the break, we were talking about how um, a recent, one of the, one of the actual decisions you had on on making the retention basin deeper was influenced by some of the public and the neighbors concerns about the runoff and that leads up to my next uh, question how how community members in the town uh what rights they have um how how do they get involved in the process uh, maybe talk about how the planning board meetings they're open public meetings they're regularly scheduled and announced and you know, let's, uh, let's explore yeah, the that pl- the planning board meets the second and fourth wednesday of every month unless there's nothing on the agenda. Okay. So assuming that we have an applicant or two or three, whatever that might be, uh, on the agenda, that would then deter- determine or, or result in us having a planning, a planning board meeting. Uh, there are times that there's no applications. And if too many applications come in, then it's the staff inside of the building department that would then space out the applications so you don't have too much in one night. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Because the board meets from 7 to 10. Now, everybody on the board, not everybody, but almost everybody, has a job to go to the following morning at 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they don't stretch the meetings out till 2 o'clock in the morning as a rule to get everybody done. Uh, the the mo- meeting's supposed to end at 10. If you're really close to the completion of, a, of an application, you'll extend beyond 10. But clearly it's in the best interest of everybody to stay fresh. Mm-hmm. And so they will tr- generally try to say, okay, we'll have to continue this for another meeting, and then you arrange for another date to mm-hmm. have the applicant come back again. Right. Just for the general uh, listener out there, uh, the date that uh, Steve just mentioned is for East Brunswick. If you want to attend your own town uh, planning board meeting, please go to the website of each township. They normally publish on the township website. Right. That, that's yeah. correct, Jane. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's correct. And now the opportunity for the public participation that I guess every you have you have a certain order of the of the agenda for each for the different cases that come before the planning board. Then for each particular case matter, there's a there's a section for there's an opportunity for public 
comment and you know to voice it, their concern? It's called opening it up to the public. public. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is, and if you have a very complex um, oh. application, um, what you would generally do is we often do is if the if the applicants got five witnesses, five experts or whatever, mm -hmm. yep. and there's a very large number of people that are attending because of the interest that's been involved with the public, then um, we would have two of them, two of their witnesses appear, and then you'd open it up to the public to allow the public to ask questions of those two applicants, uh, of those Wait. two experts, okay. only because it gets lost in the weeds if you wind up having um, five people get up and then suddenly it all gets a little confusing. So this way here, it's fresh in the public's mind. Mm -hmm. Those are the two witnesses that you can question asking it questions about anything that they said mm -hmm. during the course of their presentation to the board. Mm -hmm. And so you usually tend to give everybody an opportunity that way. And, it, and we never will end a public meeting where there is public without having opened it up to the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is a criteria. Yeah. Do you have a time limit? Each person, how long they can talk? Just for example, if I go there, it'll be all night long. Yeah. So well, no, different, different boards. Some, yeah. I think that some, question comes some, from from some boards in town have have a limit on oh, it. The, that, the, but the, I don't. Yeah. So that's a good. The town point. council has a limit of five minutes. Okay, yeah. and and then this the school board has a limit of three minutes. Yeah. yeah but and, and again, but no, both of the the boards yeah. do not have a limit. Um, it's rarely the case that you want to ask somebody for a big hook to pull somebody off of, yeah. the, of their... When they get up to speak, they're the public. It, they have every right in the world to, to discuss their pros or, or cons yeah. of an right. application. Do you get involved in, in uh, situations with, with cell towers, or is that something that would go before the planning board as well as the zoning board? Or zoning the, board. Zoning board, okay. It's always going to... Yeah. yeah. I have um, another question. Yeah. Uh, if someone, say, for example, they want to de develop a, a religious uh, 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 building, right? I mean, um, but the zoning, uh, the, the 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 zoning of the property is uh, R three or or kind, right? Do they go to the zoning board or do they go to the planning board? They would generally go to the zoning board. Zoning board. Okay. There are isolated cases where they go to the planning board, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there, there's an there's a case that went went last year. I prefer not to discuss. No, not, not don't, don't, no, 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 spe no. Spe specific uh, cases. But um, huh? it was an institution that had an existing building and wanted to expand it. Mm -hmm. yes. That went before the planning board. Mm -hmm. But there are times, for example, that a religious institution mm -hmm. wants to advance something. Mm -hmm. They would then go to the zoning board. And we've had cases on the zoning board where they want to expand the parking lot or they want to do something else or they want to put in an adjunct school. Mm -hmm. That would generally go back to the zoning board. And the fact is, is that the first realization is, is that all religious institutions are considered inherently beneficial. Mm -hmm. So they've okay. already got 90% of the requirements necessary. 90 is just a norm. Yeah, no, no, yeah it number. Not, yeah. Um, that they've met in the, in, in the criteria to be allowed to do what it is that they want. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. So, um, and then talking about the environmental, that one of the questions I had, which I think you you answered uh, partially was how does this how does the planning board address wetlands floodplains um green spaces i guess that's all part of your your you, you rely on the experts to provide you the documentation and then you guys make your con you guys make an intelligent decision based on your um you know collective decision based on the on weighing all the circumstances that's true but there's also uh, other regional agencies that have oversight for example um, freehold soil happens to be for locally in, in, in East Brunswick. They have oversight over all major soil movement activity. Right. And uh, if it looks like the application is going to create some significant issues that way, then they would um, they would voice their concerns. And so the applicants look at that and they realize this is not going to work right. We need to go back to make sure that we can get past freehold soil before we wind up getting turned down by an agency that we 
you know, can't can't win. S- similarly, environmental commissions and mm-hmm. environmental issues. You know, anytime you you have anything with this, uh, you know, gray soil or contaminated soil, mm-hmm. they the applicant has to meet the standards required in order to make that workable. Right. And I guess the same would would apply to wetlands too. There's different buffer zones, and you have to get the DEP's approval, and you have to. And I'm sure, as part of the planning board process, you guys review the the wetlands delineation surveys and and all the buffers, so you make sure that everything is complied with and approved before you even consider it any further, right? We we don't yeah. physically do that. The but, engineering firms okay, we're you, involved with are the ones that would make the point of the uh, of the green green spaces and and the wetlands and all of that. Okay. All right. So I guess a lot of, uh, there could, there could be situations that you've had in the past where, where, where on paper, the, somebody wants to build a warehouse or a commercial building. It meets all the requirements, the stormwater drainage, the environmental requirements, but there still could be some disagreement because maybe the public says, you know what, we want more open space. We don't want another <coughs> building here. So you could have, I'm sure in your career in, in uh, planning, there's been situations that have arisen where there has been something that's that's certainly doable, but there might be dis- disagreement between the public and different members of, about whether it's good to do it or not to do it based on, you know, some people want open space and less development. So that's something, I guess, that comes up. Well, some of the things that do come up, for example, now there's new legislation regarding square footage on the roof for solar panels. We just had a... We just, <laughs> The last, the prior week, uh, last Sunday, we just interviewed, and I think I shared with you that interview. We just had a whole. That's a whole new. That's that's basically revenue from the sun. Where now that that commercial flat roofs, you typically thirty thousand or more square feet, they're eligible for the solar panels, and they and they the solar panels supply third party energy to to a community, and the landlord can charge the solar panel company rent, you know, for the roof. So it's like a win win for everyone. <laughs> well, that, that's that, that's an area where that the legislation is also. A Evolving. Interesting. Because about six or seven years ago, we used to urge anybody who wanted to come before us with us with with a um, a large storage facility that they pre-set up the structure of the roof to be able to accept solar panels. Mm. Now there's it's- legislation that that New Jersey's passed that require solar panels, but not on all roofs. And so it might be like a suggestion from the zone, from the planning board. Interest. Ah, to make it more green. There you go. So you kind of balance that, that leads to like the, the challenges of how do you balance the two needs for the people that, that want green and the people that want, you know, responsible development. But that's like a, that's, that's a nice way because if you put something in, but you make it, you make it, you know, you palatable. Pal- palatable and you, you take away the fossil fuel generation, you use the energy from the sun, you're kind of balancing the interests. Yeah. Of course, the, f- the, the, the warehouse itself is obviously creating more because of the trucks that come in and e- use it, but nevertheless. E- yeah, but it, then it's creating jobs. So there's a whole, the whole, uh, yeah, there's a whole lot of uh, things that go into the whole uh, consideration, right? The employment yeah. and things, it's, a, it's a quite a, quite yeah. a lot to consider. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah, that's um, something that's really the balancing act is um, yeah. is very important. You have to wait. And the other thing that people should be aware of, and a lot of times it comes up, this happened and nobody told me. Yeah. Well, the they, applicants are I, only required to give notice publicly two hundred foot landowners. Okay. <clears throat> two, what do you mean two hundred feet away from the um, of the property line? Okay. Yeah. So you make an imaginary line. I guess the engineers would do it. And they do certified by notice how? By certified mail? Certified mail. Okay. And they send it out. So there may be somebody in a development that's 700 feet away from something that might impact them. But they're not obligated by law to get noticed of it. But I'm sorry to interrupt. But also, even if they don't get noticed, uh, the zoning meetings, what's going to be on the agenda, that's a public, that's published on the website, Right. So anybody, planning, anybody planning, planning and zoning, planning, yes. yeah, planning and zoning. So anybody, any resident can, if they want to keep abreast, they can just go to the website and check. Well, yeah, check but that. it's so, sort of like so, if you don't know about it, how you, do you don't, know to look. Yeah, okay, but and, and but, so they they come in and justifiably they're mad or they're upset or irate. Right. But the fact is, is that the board you can't get. We have no control over that. The law is two hundred feet, and so if the applicant complied with all of the legalities. The, the, the application is considered legitimate. Mm-hmm. 
All right. Well, Steve, thank you so much. No, we're no, just about out. Yeah, okay. One, one, one question. Okay, wrap it. Yeah. How do people, uh, like uh, the, the citizen, get involved to apply the, the position to be part of the planning board? Okay. The, the planning board. Yeah. Planning sorry, board. Yeah. The planning board is a mayoral appointment. Oh. The planning board. Okay. So if anybody wants to try to apply to be a member on the open of the planning board, um, they're certainly welcome. I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't wish a whole tire, you know, an avalanche of people, <laughs> you know, go, yeah. going to the mayor's office and asking because I, I think that would probably be ill-advised. But nevertheless, um, that's, you know, the general public and the mayor is the one who makes the, that decision. Okay. I All just, right. You know, want to, uh, a lot of people, my client or a lot of listeners, they want to be part of the uh, community. So just want to uh, explain the process. Yeah. So reach out to your mayor, your yeah, and find out more information. Well, Steve, thank you so much. We're out of time. We're going to have to have you come back next week. We want to talk about your role as the zoning chairperson. Okay. You're welcome. All right. We'll see you next Sunday. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your weekend.